Police are just leaving a scene where they say they found evidence of prostitution and human trafficking. I'm here at the back entrance of Ocean Spa Massage off Henderson Boulevard. And if you follow me back here around this porch, you can see where local business owners say they've seen girls as young as 11 years old wearing nothing but lingerie. Undercover agents responded to ads that used telltale words that hinted at sex with minors. The FBI is telling us agents have rescued more than 100 children from sex trafficking rings in cities across the country. Unfortunately, each day, human beings are forced into slavery. In today's terms, we call it human trafficking. What seemed to be something of the past still haunts us today. It is estimated that more than 20 million men, women, and children around the world are victims of human trafficking. Over 100,000 are trafficked each year in the United States. Recent FBI data suggests it's becoming more and more of an issue for children growing up right in our backyards. I wish to take a moment and honor a victim, a special woman who is now a survivor. To be victorious, one must first win the fight, but some of the hardest fights to conquer are from within. Years ago, Leah was one of these victims. She escaped and is now living a victorious life as a survivor, and I wish to welcome Leah to share her personal journey. Welcome, Leah, to Epic Victories Hour. Hi, how are you? Good. I wish to start at the beginning. So can you tell us about growing up years? Sure. I experienced my mom um, seeing a lot of abuse physically from her as well as I was physically abused by my stepfather for a lot of my younger life. And then at the age of six years old, I was molested by a family member of mine and then Again, at the age of 13. So I went through a lot of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse as a child. At the age of 14, my mom moved me back to the state where I was to meet my biological dad for the first time. And he basically didn't want me. I, I didn't have any room for me in his life at that time. And I ended up in CPS custody from the age of 14 years old to 18 years old. When I look back at it, uh, on how it started, I just, I had no value in, in myself or in um, the very minimal things of, of, of a girl at a young age feeling like uh, sex is valuable and that you're to love yourself. I lost all of that. Because I didn't have that. And there were so many men that took advantage of me as a, a young girl and a, a child alone. How did really the nightmare begin for you? I met this guy. This guy, he just seemed very different. Um, he seemed persistent and sweet and charming. And started to establish a trust relationship with him where um, we started to date. And dating became, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend. And I was in literally in a relationship with him for three months until he started pressuring me, you know, hey, let's go to California. And at first I was like, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go to California. Or, you know, I was not so quick to go because I was content where I was because I had my own apartment. I had my own car. But he kept telling me this fairy tale that, you know, to go out here, I have so much more money. Eventually, just because I was chasing more and more to try to fill this void that I had on the inside, thinking that it would make me happy, um, I agreed, as long as I used to take my friend with me. And everything was okay the first day we were out there. I ended up going to the strip club. The second night... Everything seemed normal, and then towards the end of the night, he got upset because I was talking to someone, and, and he felt disrespected, so he grabbed me by my throat, and he started choking me and dragged me into the, the woman's bathroom. At this point, I was like, okay, what just happened? And I was in a place, in a, in a state where I didn't know anyone. I was in an unfamiliar place. I'd never been in the city that he had me in. I go back and I find my friend. I said, hey, you know, he just put his hands on me. So we get back to the hotel, and me and the girl that I'm with are saying, you know, hey, we don't want to be here. We want to go back home. 
And in that moment, he actually reached over and he hit my friend with his fist in her eye. But he hit her so hard that her eyes started to bleed. And that's when I sat down on the bed and I said, okay, hold up. Let me think about this. Because it was like he turned into this aggressive monster. My heart started racing and all of a sudden I just got really stuck and I just got scared. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick it out. I'm going to do what he says until I go back to Arizona and then I'm just going to run and leave. But I never went back to Arizona. So at that point, how did you escape? I actually was with him for two years before I escaped. It took me from state to state. I've been all the way to, you know, D.C., from Florida to California, Texas. I mean, just so many states where I was trafficked. And in the very beginning, I also ended up getting pregnant. Now it wasn't just me that I was fighting for. Now, once I had this child, he had a piece of, of, of me. And it was like, as long as I got this child, I always have this disease over your head. And he had his family watch my child at the time. I was always allowed to see my son with his supervision or with his family supervision. So I was basically forced into even doing more because it was like, if you try to leave me or if you do anything now, not only am I going to be, you know, threatening you and your grandmother, I'm going to be threatening your son as well. He didn't care nothing about He only cared about one thing, which was money. And I remember shortly before me getting away from him, he ended up dropping me off at a track. And basically, for, for those of you that don't know what that is, it's uh, a street where it's highly prosecuted. So they call it a, a track where a lot of girls are being trafficked. And he dropped me off, and he went around to a coffee shop right next door, and he ended up getting stopped this time. He did not die. Um, he was in the hospital. Still recruiting other girls at the time to try to enter into the life. And he was doing it through the Internet because, you know, he could pose to be whatever person it is that they were looking for. His brother actually ended up taking over the business. And when I went out of town with his brothers, um, that's when I got raped at gunpoint. When I got raped at gunpoint, I remember laying on my back and I was crying so hard. And I was just praying to God that, you know, please get me out of this. Help me. I'm scared. I don't want my, my kids to find out that this is how my life ended. And I went back that day and I, I was pretty hard that, you know, I would just get out of this situation. Then the pimp was still in the hospital. He was recruiting a girl, so like I said, and when he recruited the girls, uh, two girls from Arizona that were undercover police, and um, one was posed in to be a 17-year-old, and the other one was posed in to be a 19-year-old girl. And how we got involved in it is he told them that we were going to pick them up when we go back to California. When we picked up the car in Arizona, that's when we got arrested. I was so fearful to say anything because I knew that if I did say something, what would happen to my son, what would happen to me, what would happen to my family. So I didn't say anything. Sounds like you just felt alone and depressed and life must have really weighed on you at that time. What exactly happened after this transition going into the system? Did you at all receive the help that you needed? And did your story get out there as to what was happening? Well, I actually stayed in jail for a bar. And um, I actually signed a plea for seven years. Because it was either sign the plea or go to trial with uh, the pimp. And I knew that I was going to lose. So I said, I'll rather sign a plea and get out one day. Signed the plea and about two weeks later, I received in the mail saying that this person had my son. My son was kidnapped the whole time. So the next time that I went to court, I showed it to my lawyer, and they all went to the back, and they said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and continue this. But when they did, um, two weeks after that, when I was still in custody, uh, undercover came and visited me, and she talked to me, and she was the same detective that actually originally arrested me. 
And she said, that, what would she be able to do to help me? And I said, you know, I need help. I need to be in a program that's going to help. And there was a program through um, Catholic Charities at the time that actually helped me. And the next time I went to court, they said they're going to release me into a one-year program so I can get the help that I needed. That I did everything that I could. I got a job right away. I completed my DED. I, you know, established a relationship back with my kid. Got the counseling that I needed. Um, I got the showing that I needed. So that way that when I got out of that program, I could live life on, on life terms. So a lot of times, um, you know, when we pray for something, we think that it's going to happen a certain type of way. But I prayed that he would get me out of that lifestyle. So I didn't want to be in it no more. And the, his way of saving me was actually jail at that time. Now, a journey to victory and a new life can be a long one. How did you manage to move forward? You know, I had a huge support system when I was basically changing my life through that process of that year program. The program had mostly survivors, so they kind of could relate to you, as well as um, I had a mentor and I had counselors and the detective that originally arrested me was a huge support as well, as well as my family, too. The whole time I was with him, I never told them I was being trafficked. They didn't find out until I went to jail. I really believe that that's what really helped me out on not giving up at that time. And after all the things happened, how did you overcome and become victorious? I knew that God had a calling on this earth for me to express and help other women and also to um, educate the community because I feel like sometimes it's not that we don't care as a whole, that we think that this only happens in uh, other countries, that this is not a United States issue, but it is. It's, it's, it's all of our issues. Uh, no one is exempt from this happening to, and, and that's why my, my passion and my heart, it, just, it goes to wanting to help young girls. It, it goes to wanting to help these victims that are still stuck in this life. How did you get the confidence to share your story? At first, I wasn't completely sure why I went through what I went through. God revealed to me that I need to step up and I need to try to save these young women that are stuck in this lifestyle, that feel like there is no hope, that feel like when you get out of this lifestyle, there is nothing else. Because that's what's brainwashed into our minds. For such a long time, it took me literally a year to even start speaking for myself again because I was so much under control how he wanted me to dress, how he wanted me to eat. My body no longer belonged to myself. So it, it was basically uh, symbolic to just letting it go and just opening up to the world that this is happening. And it's not just happening to one girl. This is happening to thousands and thousands of girls. Have you ever met victims? Have you ever personally helped them? And what was your experience yeah. in that? Um, I'm actually, I work with a, the university out here in Arizona, and I mentor a lot of girls. I mentor girls that are basically just new coming out of the life. Either they just left their predator or their pimp, and I mentor them and they they just have such good hearts. These these young women are so beautiful and they have so much going for themselves, but they just have been abused. And a lot of people have did a lot of uh, really horrible things to them. And when you just embrace them with love and you give them just that time, but just saying, hey, you know, I'm here for you, you know, instead of judging them or thinking that they're disgusting or that it's their fault that this stuff has happened to them because it's not. What advice do you give these young women or what would you actually give if maybe someone is listening to this today who's recently afflicted by this? What would you say to them to help them rise above? part is to take a step and to leave the situation. The second part would be to stay out of the situation. And I want to encourage young women that you can do all things to Christ that serves in you. So don't feel like it's impossible. It is possible. And as long as you have, you give your all to the situation and saying, I don't want to do this no more and I don't want to go back, doors will continue to open for you. 
but you have to want it for yourself. And you have to believe in yourself. And you have to start loving yourself. And the only way that you can start doing that is taking that first step and getting out of that disease. Nicely said. Now, how has your life changed because of this? I always was a strong person, but I didn't realize it until now. I didn't realize what God's plans were for me until now. And and I want to help young girls so much because I don't want anyone to ever go through what I went through. It just it breaks my heart to know that it's still happening right now. And one of the things that I dealt with is really bad post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, girls that come out of that lifestyle, they, they deal with different issues and they deal with this disorder as well because of so many horrible things happening to us. So out of the bad does come the good, it sounds like, and part of that is helping others and wisdom, maturity, strength. Out of all of these, I mean, what do you think is the greatest, the greatest attribute or the greatest thing that you've learned out of all of this? To love yourself. I believe that most girls that are judging this life, they don't tell anyone, and it's really because sometimes they're looking for something. They're looking for that dad. They're looking for that boyfriend. They're looking for someone who thinks they're beautiful, they're loved. And a lot of times it's just something that we're missing on the inside of just loving ourselves so much that we'll never, ever let no one do this to us again. Loving ourselves so much that we make a decision to just leave. And no matter what the consequences are, we're ready to take that step. Because it's better than staying in that situation and ending up in I don't know where. That where could very well be dead, considering the situation and the horrific things that happen to people. And I do have to commend you on helping others and for all your efforts. And I do want to give you your time to kind of talk a little bit about how you are helping others and tell me about your book and what you're doing. It's called Game Over. And a couple people have asked, well, why is the title Game Over? And when you're actually in the industry, they call it the game. And the reason why I say game over is because for me, it is game over. There is no more game for me. So May 13th is the day that the book comes out. The last day that I was trafficked was May 13th, 2011. Currently, an uh, advocate, a speaker, churches and judges and, you know, the prosecutors and stuff on the uh, prostitutes' behalf and the victims' behalf as well. So that way people know, you know, what we feel about. And that we're, you know, we're not criminals necessarily. If we're going to jail for, for prosecution and things like that, a lot of times we're being trafficked. We have no choice. Him utilize their advantage. And they really are on those you know, paths. And social media is a huge one. You know, anything that you can think of that your young children be on, they're on there and they're trying to recruit girls. So, you know, one of my biggest suggestions is just to be aware of what your children are doing, have talks with them, communicate with them, that they shouldn't just leave with strangers, they shouldn't just leave out of state, um, see what's going on, who their friends are. That's one of the biggest things for me is just to make sure that you're speaking to your young teenagers and, and young women. What do you hope to achieve? Someone is a survivor. To just be able to help them if they need help with child care or just different things, jobs, to find jobs, places for employment where they can find jobs, and things like that. Just that transitional standpoint, I want to definitely be a supporter to my little sister. Do you want to share any of your links to some of your work? For instance, your website, how can people contact you? You can contact me at IamLeahRogers.com as well as all of my social media links are I am Leah Rogers as well. And if you just want to talk about this is happening to someone you know, or if it's you that it's happened to, to definitely be a support. Thank you, Leah, for sharing your personal journey to victory. It's been an amazing one. And we encourage all of those affected by human trafficking to get help or report a tip by calling the National Human Trafficking Resource Center at one eight eight eight. Three seven three seven eight eight eight. The National Human Trafficking Resource Center is a national nonprofit toll-free hotline available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. And volunteers are waiting to help you. Again, that number is one eight 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 
373-7888 or text be free B E F R E E or 233733. To stay up to date with new victories and stories of overcoming, visit our website or join us on Facebook at Epic Victories, inspiring our world and local communities. Thank you for joining us on our quest to help others rise above to victory. Thank you, Leah, and all those listening. Have a victorious week and God bless. Thank you.